It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Today, the public galleries are full of people who have come here to advocate for core services for autistic kids. They have come here to remind the government that there are over, right now, over 60,000 autistic children on the growing wait list. They have come to hold the government to its promise to clear the backlog. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Will this government finally provide the funding needed to get these kids off the wait list and into the services they need? Members, will please take their seats. And to reply for the government, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Just uh, the facts that we have doubled the funding. We have five times more children receiving services than any uh, time under the previous Liberal government. And, and let's be clear, when we came to uh, office, we understood that the old program under the, the Liberal government had, had little prospect for delivering uh, services to 75% of the children who were waiting. And that's why we have doubled the funding. It's why we have created a comprehensive program that is created by the autism community for the autism community community. It's why we've expanded beyond the ABA services. It's why we've added in and we heard people, they wanted speech language pathology, they wanted occupational therapy, they wanted mental health services, and we've done that. We've launched foundational family services, entry to school program, caregiver mediated early years program, core clinical Response. services as well. And that's why we built Access OAP to support families through every step of their journey with care coordinators. And we're already seeing results. Over 40,000 children are receiving supports today, almost five times more. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government's words don't hold any weight with this, these families that are here with us today because it doesn't match their reality, not one bit. The wait list has more than doubled since the Conservative government came into power. Children are waiting a minimum of four years for any kind of services or even assessment. Four years that can make all the difference for that child's quality of life. And this government is sitting on almost six and a half billion dollars unspent. So back to the Premier, back to the Premier. You promised to fix the autism program. Will you make good on your promise and clear the wait list? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And that's exactly why we expanded the diagnostic hubs. And unfortunately, the, the government, uh, the opposition sitting across from me, has not uh, s supported those in, in its votes. It voted against it. Our government is the one that is providing the services, creating the program, a world-leading program. The previous Liberal government promised results and only delivered support to 25 percent of the children. And as of January, every child in the program had been invited to enroll with Access OAP. It's our government that is creating this world-leading program. We have created Access OAP. We've been reaching out to families through emails, through phone calls, uh, through letters to make sure that people are aware of the registration Spons? process. For Access OAP. This is a comprehensive program created by the autism community for the autism community, and we're implementing it. In the final supplementary. Speaker, it's astonishing that this government never admits the problem, never even acknowledges it. More than 60,000 children are waiting for core services. That is nothing to be proud of. And for context, like that's 2,500 classrooms of children. Think of it that way, right? You want to know the real story? Here's the real story. By last August, this government had registered fewer than 900 kids for support. At this rate, it's going to take 66 years just to clear the existing backlog. None of us are going to be here in 66 years, but I mean, the families here today have come to Queen's Park from across the province to tell their stories, to be heard, to demand change after this government's shocking failure to support autistic children, and they deserve real accountability. But only one Conservative MPP has agreed to meet with them. Thank you, Speaker. My question, question. My question is to the Premier and to his government. Will you meet with these families? I think I need to point out that I no longer have caucus with the uh, government side. I'm impartial. The response? Minister? 
Thank you, Speaker. We knew that the, the program for autism that we inherited from the previous government supported by the NDP was not a, a program that was serving families as it needed to do. And that's why we built a new program. That's why we listened at town halls across the province to make sure that we understood. That's why we created different streams, foundational family services, caregiver mediated early years program, entry to school program, urgent response services. We listened. People wanted mental health services, they wanted speech therapy, they wanted occupational therapy. We listened and we put that into the program. We created Access OAP so that it would be an independent intake organization that would help families navigate with care co coordinators. This is a needs-based program based on domains of need. It, it, it allows families to have their own unique needs Response. addressed. This is a program that is world-leading that has never been done before in that we understand or researched, and it is based on research and clinical evidence and will continue to implement this important program. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Sure, I, I have another important question, but I, I just want to say it's disgraceful that this government will not meet with the families that are here today. Uh, and, and you know what? Five years. You've been, you've been in this office. It's your mess now. It's your mess now. Yep. Speaker, under this government's watch, the mental health crisis facing Ontario has also only gotten worse. We've proposed a solution that would make a real difference in people's lives. Reduce the wait list for children's mental health care. Invest in improved crisis response. Expand therapy access and boost community mental health care. And we've put forward an opposition motion for debate this afternoon for an 8% emergency stabilization investment in community mental health care. My question is to the Premier, will he support our motion? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government takes mental health in the province of Ontario very seriously. I'm the first minister appointed to look after mental health and addictions issues in the province. We came up with a roadmap to wellness, which is a basic plan, a foundational document that looks after lifespan, so it looks after investments required for children and youth, for adults, for seniors, for people with addictions and concurrent disorders. We backed it with a $525 million a year plan, $3.8 billion over 10 years. Seeing the crisis, another $90 million February of last year was invested to create 400 treatment beds, which is the equivalent of 7,000 treatment spots throughout the province of Ontario, not just in southern Ontario, everywhere in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, the investments continue. When we speak about the investments Response. that have been made with respect to mobile crisis intervention teams, over $40 million have been put in place to create low barrier access for individuals needing supports. So yes, investment. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Supplementary question. Minister Speaker talks about roadmap to uh, wellness. It's a roadmap to nowhere right now. I'll tell you. We are in a mental health crisis in every community in this province, but in Indigenous and Northern and rural communities, the government's not even trying to pretend. They're just failing miserably. We've got epidemic rates of suicide, homelessness, addictions. The Canadian mental health associations show skyrocketing demand for their services, but in Al Algoma, they're only getting a 2% increase in base funding over the past 10 years, 2%. In Kenora, they got just 2% over the last 22 years. Wow. They need an 8% emergency stabilization investment today. So my question again to the Premier, you're sitting on, you've got unspent $6.4 billion, unspent. Question. Will he support our motion this afternoon to provide that 8% emergency funding? Yeah. Associate Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, I reiterate, the province of Ontario, this government, is making substantial, unprecedented investments throughout the province of Ontario to assist anyone in need. For instance, you mentioned Indigenous communities. Indigenous communities is a focus of the work that we're doing, providing land-based healing opportunities to allow Indigenous communities to look after the needs of the people in their communities. Rural and remote communities, we're investing in mobile health units to allow individuals access to care which may they not 
otherwise get, given the fact that there are large distances to travel. Mr. Speaker, we continue to make investments and work with all service providers in the province of Ontario to ensure that people are getting the supports they need. I look back at what we inherited as a government, and I've got to call out once again what Response. the NDP did. They reduced 13 percent of the mental health beds. They took away 9,645 hospital beds across the province. During Thank you. And the final supplementary. Speaker, um, I don't even know what to do with that. Mental health care is life-changing, right? It's also cost-saving. It's cost-saving. It Order. frees up hospital beds. You have less 911 calls, and you know what? It saves lives. And that's why today we are going to go all out on this issue, because people in Ontario cannot wait any longer. And I'm sure there's not one of us in this entire room that hasn't seen the impact on our families and in our communities. So let's do it. 8% emergency stabilization investment into CMHA, that's $24 million. So my question to the Premier today, Premier, please, will you take just half a percent of that $6.4 billion that's been scrolled away, unspent, help people question. get the mental health care they so desperately need today? And the Associate Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, I reiterate, the government in the province is making investments across the board in education by providing prevention and opportunities to help, in, help young people with their mental health, unprecedented investments in the, in the mental health for children and youth. We've made investments last year increasing 5% to the community-based children and youth supports. We've continued making the investments and speaking with and understanding the issues that need to be addressed in the province of Ontario. We have an opioid crisis. We're working to ensure that the supports are in place to assist individuals that want to recover from an addiction. Mr. Speaker, once again, I can't stop but think of what the implications were when the NDP were in power and they cut $53 million Response. of funding to the psychiatric hospitals. Order. The implications that that had with the fact that we have a shortage in HHR today directly related back to the fact that places were eliminated. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. What a shameful answer from the minister. People in this province are dying because they cannot access the mental health supports they need, and that's the kind of answer you give. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Ontario is facing a mental health crisis. More Ontarians are seeking mental health supports, and demand for services has significantly increased under this Conservative government. Across Ontario, people are experiencing anxiety, depression, and burnout at higher rates. Yet, base funding for the Canadian Mental Health Association has fallen significantly behind the rate of inflation. The Mental Health Strategy for Canada recommends raising mental health funding to approximately $5.0 billion in Ontario alone. Speaker. Speaker, will the Premier commit to treating mental health care as health care and provide the desperately needed funding for mental health supports? I just make your comments through the chair, the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again for that question because it highlights what we know, the fact that investments have to be made, and the government is making unprecedented investments, but the investments that it's making are ensuring that the continuum of care is being dealt with, the children and youth are being looked after, our adults are being looked after, our seniors are being looked after focusing on addictions and the concurrent disorders that need to be addressed, the 400 treatment beds that have been opened, the 7,000 treatment spots that have been created. These are all increasing capacity Order. to be able to assist individuals. And Mr. Speaker, we're focused on culturally appropriate and sensitive services, creating low barrier access to individuals in need, ensuring that the supports are there when and when they need them, if they're ready for them to recover. But the harm reduction provisions that we put in place are also assisting Response. individuals. Mr. Speaker, we are building a system for the province of Ontario after the neglect of the previous government, supported by the NDP. Uh, the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. About 28,000 children and youth were on wait lists for mental health treatment in January 2020. That was under this Conservative government, more than double 2017, according to Ch Children's Mental Health Ontario. Again, under this government, 
those supports, the needs for those supports, has gotten even greater between 2020 and now. Estimates show that more than 200,000 children with serious mental health issues have no contact with the mental health care system, again, under this Conservative government. Windsor, my community, has one of the longest wait times in the province for intensive children's mental health care, an average wait of 588 days. A failure, Minister. Children can't wait. They need access to services immediately. Speaker, will the Premier commit today to capping wait times for mental health care for children and youth? And the Associate Minister. Mr. Speaker. Clearly, children and youth need accessible and reliable services if they're going to grow into healthy adults. And since 2019, $130 million has gone to children and youth mental health services via the Roadmap to Wellness. Roadmap slates another $170 million over the next three years. Education, $90 million for school-based supports, $20 million for an across-the-board 5% funding increase to all government mental health agencies during COVID. That was done, and it has improved, and it has helped the organizations. We're proud of our youth and wellness hubs, which have been created now and stand at 22 across the province of Ontario, including one in Sagamuk, an Indigenous community. Roadmap to Wellness outlines the vision for children and youth, early interventions to kids from harmful behaviors, and is a great return on investment. And we will continue to build a future for our children to ensure that they have the mental health supports where and when they need them. Okay. Next question, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. In every community, paramedics are on the front lines each and every day saving lives. These everyday heroes work tirelessly to bring us medical care when we need it the most. Paramedics, along with ambulance communication officers, regularly encounter risk and traumatic events that can impact their health and safety. Under the previous Liberal government that was propped by the NDP, there was no advocacy, no action on behalf of these essential emergency workers to address their industry-specific risk. They had years to act. Instead, they chose to ignore the needs of our frontline workers. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is protecting the health and safety of these workers? Of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, and I want to thank the member uh, for Scarborough Rouge for this very important question. Uh, Speaker, Ontario's paramedics and ambulance communication officers are truly heroes uh, in our health care system. They are innovative and always willing to take on new roles to support our government in building a more comprehensive and connected health care system. Our government created a standalone committee under Section 21 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act to develop resources that address unique health and safety risks that these frontline heroes face every single day serving our families and our communities. Mm -hmm. This new Paramedic Services Committee will complement the existing first responder committees for fire and police services while providing a focused channel for recommendations from experts, employers and workers. Both labour leaders and chiefs and all paramedics have been calling for this committee now for more than 20 years, and under the leadership of our Premier, our government is getting it done for them. And this supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. It is clear that workers in this sector are valued by our government, and our priority is to advocate for the support, protection, and safety that they deserve. The risk that paramedics and ambulance communication officers face are separate and distinct from the other healthcare workers, professionals, and they interact with patients in unpredictable and complex situations. Under the leadership of Premier, Minister of Health, and this minister, actions such as this announcement demonstrate our government's commitment to foster safe workplaces. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate about how the new paramedic services section 21 committee will improve safety for this sector. Mr. Labour. Well, great. Mr. Speaker, our government was pleased to address this long outstanding request as our government recognizes and supports the important work of this sector uh, in our healthcare system. This announcement demonstrates that our government listened to unions, including uh, Unifor, CUPE, SEIU, and OPSU, 
representing frontline paramedics and ambulance communication officers, as well as the strong advocacy from paramedic uh, chiefs and the Ontario Association of Paramedic Chiefs, which represents every paramedic service across the province. This committee is a great opportunity for paramedics, ambulance communication officers and paramedic chiefs to make important recommendations and provide practical guidance for employers and workers. The creation of this committee is a vital investment in the physical, emotional and psychological well-being of our paramedics and ambulance communication officers. Our government, Mr. Speaker, is working for workers in building a stronger Ontario that leaves no one behind. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. In Ontario, there are over 28,000 children and youth waiting for community mental health care, with wait times as long as two and a half years. Cutting wait times to 30 days will ensure timely access to care. It will help prevent needs from worsening and wait lists for more acute services from growing. Providing early intervention programs will also cost the province less and reduce the burden on our health care system. I've tabled a bill to cap wait times for children and youth mental health to 30 days. Speaker, kids can't wait. My question to the Premier, will you pass it? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Children and youth have the highest mental health care needs of any age demographic. We know this. This informs every investment we have made and will continue to make. In 2022, we invested another $31 million in new annual funding to reduce wait lists and support the mental health and well-being of children and youth. We are innovating on new ways to treat children and youth and new means for them to access care. This means $3.5 million in the Step Up, Step Down Live and Treatment program, helping move kids through levels of intensive treatment. $2.1 million virtual walk-in counselling connecting youth to a clinician by phone, text or video chat. A million dollars for children and youth telehealth services. Four and a half million dollars for one-stop talk virtual walk-in counselling program Response. for children and youth. Mr. Speaker, we're innovating, we're working with the sector, we're ensuring that the kids have the supports they need where they need them. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for St. Catharines. Speaker. To the minister, my question is to the Minister of Health and Addictions. In Niagara, we know what is at risk if we do not cap wait times for children that need mental health services. This is because we have nearly 900 children on a wait list for mental health services with Pathstones, a core mental health service provider in Niagara. Last week, we heard from teachers ringing the alarm bells about children's mental health. However, this problem deserves a comprehensive response because most of Pathstone's referrals come in the summer when the schools are closed. Minister, will your office consult with the experts in the field today, create a cap for wait times, and ensure these core service organizations get the funding they need in the upcoming budget? Good question. Associate Minister. Mr. Speaker, and once again, we know the needs of the children in terms of the supports that are required to ensure that they have mental health supports. And the initiatives that we're working on are initi initiatives to increase access to supports, addressing increased demand as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, because that has had implications as well on their, on their mental health. We're working to decrease wait times. We're looking to improve the quality of care that, for children and youth. And yes, I have and will continue to meet with all stakeholders to ensure that we understand the needs, not just of the children and youth in general, but on a region-by-region -region basis. And that has been the way we've done our work to date. We've attended meetings, we've had roundtables throughout the province, in Thunder Bay, in Indigenous communities throughout the North, Response. in Southern Ontario, and of course with children and youth mental health. Mr. Speaker, we're more prepared than any government in Ontario's history to build an accessible, equitable and accountable mental health system. Thank you. Next question, the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Oh, Many people in Whitby, Ajax, Bowenville and Pickering want to be more connected to the Greater Toronto Area. Under the previous Liberal government, Supported by the NDP, the people of Whitby 
and other parts of Durham Region were promised speaker year after year that new transit investments would be made. Nothing ever materialized. Nothing. They're tired of waiting. They expect our government to take action and deliver on extending much needed transit infrastructure for the people of the region of Durham. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please update the House on the progress of the Bowmanville Go expansion Question. project? Great. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question and his outstanding work on behalf of the residents of Whitby. Speaker, I'm really happy to let that member know that Metrolinx will be announcing the successful construction manager of the transformational Bowmanville Go extension later this spring. This successful manager will be chosen from the four candidates that were shortlisted uh, by Metrolinx following a very promising proposal uh, window that was uh, closed last October. Speaker, this is a major step that our government is taking in delivering that game-changing uh, commuting service for GO Transit uh, for the people of Durham with two-way, all-day rail, ser rail service to Bowmanville. In fact, Speaker, our 20-kilometre extension of the Lakeshore East Line will make it easier for people to connect to local transit, work, health care, education, and other critical services across Durham Region. Speaker, while the opposition Fonts? widened the transit gap for decades, this government is getting it done for the great people of Durham. The supplementary question. Speaker, uh, thank you to the Associate Minister for the update on this very important project. This is encouraging news for many individuals and hardworking families in my riding. Transit infrastructure expansion is vital for Durham Region as it will help connect the people, not only of my riding, but other ridings in the region of Durham, to their families, work, and increase access to critical services. With the population of the Greater Toronto Area expected to increase significantly over the coming years, investments in transit expansion are needed now to ensure frequent and convenient service for the years to come. Speaker, we can't afford to delay or hold back transit investments. Speaker, now Question. is the time to build. Now is the time to get Ontario moving. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on our government's actions to deliver transit for the hardworking people of the region of Durham? The Associate Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And the member is absolutely right. The time is now because we have a growing population in this province with hundreds of thousands of people moving here every single year. And that means we need to build transit, fill the gap that was left by the opposition. That's exactly what we're doing. As next steps, Metrolinx will continue to work to advance infrastructure and service planning while engaging uh, with Durham Region to make sure that we can deliver this vital project. Speaker, this is going to be a game changer for the people of Durham Region and Bowmanville Go Extension. That means that commuters will be able to take a train every 30 minutes and go back and forth to Union Station, Bowmanville Go, and everything in between. Speaker, what's more, the riders will save 15 minutes in their commutes along the corridor so they can more easily get to work appointments wherever it is that they need to go. Speaker, it's clear that the NDP, when they propped up the Liberals for decades, did nothing to build transit. This is the only government Order. getting it done for the people of Durham and for commuters in Ontario. The next question. A member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. Anti black racism wrecks, ha wrecks havoc on the souls of black people, 400 years and counting. Healthcare workers, among others, have long called for this government to recognize anti black racism as a public health emergency detrimental to our physical and mental health. RNAO's Black Nurses Task Force study surveyed 205 black nurses and nursing students across Ontario and found 88% had reported experiencing anti-black racism and discrimination at work. My question is to the Premier. Will you join several cities across the province and take a solid step towards recognizing the impact of anti-black racism on black Ontarians by declaring today, the first Monday in March, annually as Black Mental Health Day? Thank you. Reply, the government host leader. Well, it's, uh, uh, Look, 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 I can tell the, the member this. Uh, uh, there are avenues and opportunities for members to bring uh, important pieces of, uh, of legislation forward through the private member's uh, bill process. I know the member, I know the member has uh, had uh, uh, at least one bill passed in the, in the previous parliament. It sounds like a, an interesting uh, initiative, uh, one that we'd certainly uh, uh, be very supportive of. Uh, if Order. She would, uh, uh, 
consider. I, I'm assuming that you want to hear the answer, so I'll, I'll, I'll continue on if that's okay. So I would assume that the minister or the member would appreciate bringing forward a private member's bill that the entire House could consider. As you know, Mr. Speaker, this government has passed more private member's bills than almost any other government in its entirety, and we use House time to debate and pass those bills. The member opposite would know this because that member also had a private member's Response. bill passed, as did the member's seatmate and as did a number of members sitting on that side. So I'd be very happy as House Leader to consider that in the process of private member's business. Yeah. The supplementary question. Speaker, we actually have tabled the bill so the government can pass it today if they want. And this is the same government that thought $1,000 was enough of a budget line to address racism across Ontario in the anti-racism directive. Wow. $1,000. That's a shame. Speaker, far too many black children and adults walking while black, shopping while black, driving while black, learning while black, or having a mental health crisis while black means experiencing of racial profiling, harassment, discrimination, disproportionate use of force, and sometimes, sadly, death by law enforcement. Both the target, if they survive, and their families and the larger communities are left fraught with confusion, fear, anxiety, and depression. Anti-black racism is a structural and social determinant of physical and mental health. Premier, can you share with us what your government is doing along with your 2023 budget allocation to specifically address black mental health in Ontario. Specifically, black mental health in Ontario. Thank you. To reply, the Minister of Citizenship and Multicultural. Well, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for such uh, an important question. I'd like to start off by saying Ontario's strength is in our diversity. We are home from people from all around the world. The diversity of our people, skills, backgrounds, cultures, and faiths enriches our society in so many ways, including our black community. On this side of the aisle, we are focused on building a stronger, safer, and more inclusive Ontario where people from all walks of life can live, work, and prosper. That is why our government is investing in programs to combat racism and hate in all its forms promote diversity and inclusion, and ensure that all Ontarians have the tools, opportunities, and supports they need to succeed and reach their Response. full potential. Mr. Speaker, we will can always Order. be a champion and a strong voice for diverse communities and everything they do to make our province the great place it is. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. It's an honour to rise and uh, present my question on behalf of the people of Scarborough Guildwood, as I've done for the better part of a decade. My question is to the Premier. We know that the pandemic has been challenging for all Ontarians, and we know that this is especially true when it comes to our children. For years, our teachers have been having to deal not only with the important job of educating our children, but also juggling COVID protocols and outbreaks, including many months of online learning. What is well also well known is that the pandemic disruption in our schools resulted in learning gaps for our children and a report of burnout among and under supported teachers and education workers. And now the FAO reporting that the government underspent our education budget by $844 million. This while Question. school boards are having to consider a return to pre pandemic staffing levels. Speaker, why is this government taking money away from school boards? at a time when our students' needs are at an all-time high. And to respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure the member opposite that this government has increased funding this school year alone by $650 million more. <laughs> An investment in publicly funded schools, a sharp contrast to the closure of schools under the former Liberals. Hundreds closed and opportunities closed with it. Mr. Speaker, we are building new schools. We're investing in a modern curriculum aligned with the labour market needs so our young people can get a good job. We're ensuring mental health is increased from when the former Liberals, at the peak of spending, at $18 million in Ontario schools, it is today 400 per cent higher. It is at $90 million. Each and every year we've increased those expenditures because we believe in these kids. 
And with respect to staffing, Speaker, there are seven. 1,000 additional education wow. workers in our schools, almost 900 additional teachers, because we know our Response. kids need support, particularly because of the pandemic and the learning loss that has been realized in this province and around the country. This Premier will continue to invest to give our kids every opportunity to achieve their potential in Ontario. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. Year after year, quarter after quarter, this government is holding money back in reserves. We have all heard, and Order. the minister said this morning, that there is a roadmap to wellness, which has been in place for the last three years. Speaker, in 2022-2023, the annual Ontario School Survey cites that 91 per cent of schools are currently reporting need in student mental health and well-being. Just last week, People for Education reported they actually sounded the alarm. It shouldn't be a silent alarm. Every member of this House should hear it. 95 per cent of schools report needing some or more support of stu for students' mental health and well-being. Only 9 per cent of schools are having regularly scheduled access to mental health and addiction specialists or a nurse, and 46 per cent of schools are reporting having Question. no access at all. Speaker, can the minister explain how that they can say that they have a plan for mental health and well-being, giving only $45 per student for mental health? Why is this government holding back at a time when our students need help? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, once again, I reiterate that there is a roadmap to wellness that specifically looks at the needs of children and youth during the education period, which includes, in, which, in, which includes uh, prevention, education, and building resiliency, which is extremely important. And that is being funded, as the minister stated before, $90 million for school-based supports annualized. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, we're looking at $31 million in new annual funding Order. to reduce wait lists and supports Order. in the community, which is where the supports are needed for treatment. $11 million annually so children and youth with eating disorders can heal closer to home. Another very important Order. issue that needs to be addressed if we are going to help children and youth. In addition Order. to that, we've invested in beds. The House Leader will come to order. The member for Scarborough Guildwood will come to order. The Minister has a couple more seconds to finish his response. Mr. Speaker, investments in children's um, uh, mental health in the hospitals, seven new beds at CHEO, five at Sick Kids, two at McMaster Children's Hospital, $130 million, Mr. Response? Speaker, since 2009 through the Roadmap to Wellness. There is a plan. We're implementing the plan, and we are making a difference in the lives of children and youth throughout the province of Ontario. The next question, the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. I first want to thank all of my firefighter colleagues across our province for protecting our communities. Yeah. These everyday heroes work tirelessly to protect our province, and in return, they deserve care and support. The nature of a firefighter's work is dangerous and unpredictable. The challenges they encounter can cause lasting impacts on their health and well-being. Tragically, cancer is the leading cause of death among firefighters, accounting for more than 74 per cent of line-of-duty deaths in 2022. On average, 50 to 60 firefighters die of cancer yearly in Canada half of whom are in Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain our government's actions to increase protections for our firefighters? Thank you. Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the member for uh, Brantford Brant for that question. But most importantly to the member, thank you for your service uh, to your community as a volunteer firefighter. Thank you on behalf of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, our Premier is a tireless advocate for emergency responders who keep our community safe, and his passion for supporting them is well known. Our firefighters are heroes that put their lives on the line every single day. When others run out of burning buildings, they're running into them. On Friday, I was proud to join our Solicitor General and our friend Greg Horton, the President of the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association, who proudly represents more than 12,000 firefighters in communities right across the province. Together, we announced that our government is expanding coverage for firefighters who get pancreatic and thyroid Thoughts? cancer. 
This change will make it faster and easier for these heroes and their families to access the compensation and supports they deserve. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Speaker, firefighters provide a vital service to all of our communities. The health and safety of these first responders must remain a priority. Recently, the World Health Organization reclassified firefighting to its highest level of health and safety occupational risk for cancer. Too many firefighters have suffered with or lost their lives to cancer. Our government must demonstrate leadership to implement preventative measures, early detection and support for these first responders who serve the people of my riding and of and all Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is implementing changes to better protect and support our firefighters. Thank you. Well, thank you, the member. Speaker, we're making these changes so that firefighters who are sick can focus on getting better. We're streamlining a firefighter's workplace illness claim, making it easier for them and their families to get quicker access to benefits and services while providing peace of mind to those who are suffering. This change will apply to all 30,000 firefighters who are full-time part-time and volunteers, as well as those firefighters employed by a First Nations Band Council. Furthermore, the coverage expansion we announced is retroactive to January 1, 1960, allowing those who have suffered from these cancers in the past and their loved ones to get the supports that they deserve. Speaker, our government will always stand up for those firefighters who put their lives on the line every day for all of us. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On average, four children a week end up in a Hamilton emergency room for self-harm. There has been a significant uptake of children engaging in self-harming behaviours, yet the wait list for treatment continues to grow. The health and well-being of our children is critical, but they are not getting the help they need. I wrote to the minister back in January about this issue, and I have yet to receive a response. So I'm asking once again, will this government support our, our children and commit to investing in Hamilton's youth mental health programming and to build human resource capacity? Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Question again: Children and youth are extremely important, and providing supports and services to them is a priority for our government. And we have made it a priority, whether it be the investments in the education system, whether it be the investments in community-based treatment, whether it's specifically aimed at things like eating disorders, self-harm. Investments are being made, and we are working to reduce the wait lists. There, have, there has been, as I mentioned before, $11 million invested specifically to deal with eating disorders so that kids can have the supports they need closest to home. We invested $8.1 million to create seven beds at CHEO, five at six sick kids, and two at McMaster. So yes, we are listening. We know that there are needs, and McMaster got two beds as well. In addition to that, $130 million in 2019, or since 2019, Response. Have been, has been invested as well. And our youth wellness hubs, which is providing an incredible resource to kids between the ages of 12 and 24. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank, thank you, Speaker. Parents with anti-LGBTQ views recently disrupted a York Catholic School Board meeting saying hateful comments such as Catholic schools should not allow transgender or LGBT students to attend. With rising hate crimes, Ontario needs to ensure that all students are safe. The Premier must use his political voice to condemn discrimination and hate against the queer and trans communities who are being bullied and targeted for violence. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier fund 2S LGBT mental health supports and commit today to developing a policy to guarantee the mental health and safety of all students in every single publicly funded Ontario school, including the Catholic schools. And to respond, Minister of Education. We believe that every single child in this province has a right to be in school, to learn in school, uh, free from intimidation, from bullying and from violence. Every single child, irrespective of their faith or heritage or orientation, color of skin, place of birth, every child, 
and they need to hear that their government stands with them, recognizing that they face disproportionately high rates of mental health and suicide ideation. We know this is real, and it's why the government continues to make the case that our school system must be inclusive and must be respectful and welcoming for all of these kids, that they know that they are loved in our school system unconditionally by the staff and the communities that work with them. We have increased funding in mental health. We've actually worked with Eagle Canada and leveraged them every single year through the Priorities Fund of the Ministry of Education to support those Response. very children most at risk within our schools. Much. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent, Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. In my riding of Chatham, Kent, Leamington, St. Clair College is a vital education leader with a long history of exceptional athletics and academics. In fact, this past weekend, they captured the Men's OCAA Basketball Championship. Like all post-secondary institutions in Ontario, St. Clair College serves a critical function to prepare our students for today's jobs and the economy of the future. Unfortunately, worldwide economic challenges and rising inflation costs are now impacting the financial stability of post-secondary institutions. My constituents want to ensure that fine institutions like St. Clair can continue providing high-quality education for future generations. Our government must take bold action now to ensure stability in the sector. Speaker, can the Minister of Colleges and Universities please explain what actions our government Question. is taking to help maintain the financial stability of Ontario's post-secondary education sector? I, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our post-secondary institutions and research institutions are important sources of job creation, skills training, research, innovation, commercialization, and obviously great athletes as well, making them leading contributors to our overall economic growth. I'm thrilled to stand up today to talk about what our government is doing to support the sector and our students, including launching our new Blue Ribbon Panel. Announced last week, the Blue Ribbon Panel will provide advice and recommendations for keeping the post-secondary education sector financially stable and focused on providing the best student experience possible. Led by Dr. Alan Harrison and an incredible group of panel members, this team will support my ministry in keeping Ontario's post-secondary institutions on stable footing now and into the future. As we all know, Ontario's institutions, like St. Clair College in the members region, support the province's Spons. economy in a number of ways, including by preparing people for the labour market, engaging in research, and supporting the prosperity of local communities. Great. And supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her response. Our post-secondary education and research institutions are important sources of job creation, skills training, commercialization, and innovation. The strength of our province's economy is built on the knowledge, skills, and expertise that are gained from our post-secondary education system. Students who attend institutions like St. Clair, in my writing, are curious about what they can expect from this panel. My constituents want to know further details about how this new panel will work to make a real difference in the post-secondary education sector. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the structure and function of our government's blue ribbon panel? That's a great question. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for being a great advocate for St. Clair College. Over the coming months, the Blue Ribbon Panel will conduct research and consultations with key stakeholders about the actions Ontario can take to improve the financial sustainability of post-secondary sector to support colleges and universities in developing a skilled workforce and to promote economic growth and innovation. Specifically, the panel members will work to provide advice on how we can enhance the student experience and increase access to education, reward excellence within the sector, improve labour market alignment, and find ways to keep education affordable for students and their families. This will help support the quality, accessibility and sustainability of the post-secondary education sector now and into the future, so learners can continue to get the skills and education needed to get good jobs and meet labour market needs. And again, I'd like to congratulate Response. the men's basketball team from St. Clair College Great. on their uh, recent gold uh, medal win. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through to the Premier, last week the Niagara Regional Government declared a state of emergency for mental health, homelessness and addiction. Niagara continues to be hard hit with hundreds of people on wait lists that continue to grow. 
There are over 800 children on the wait list at Pathstone Mental Health. Regional police have seen an increase of 238 per cent in calls involving persons in crisis in the last five years. The Niagara Region and local agencies continue to do great work in a system with inadequate funding from this government. Will the Premier acknowledge our state of emergency and commit to deliver more funding and support for mental health services in Niagara right now, yes or no? Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, when we deal with issues of mental health and addictions, we do look specifically at different regions. To assist in the Niagara region, one of the things we did was open two mobile health yeah, units yeah. so that the units would be able to provide supports, especially in the rural areas where it's difficult for people because of transportation to be able to access the services. Children and youth mental health supports are being placed throughout the province of Ontario, including through our youth wellness hubs. And the youth wellness hubs are providing low barrier supports to individuals. It allows children between the ages of 12 and 24 to be able to Order. attend a place where they can get wraparound supports for everything from primary care to mental health care supports. We've worked with and will continue working with the stakeholders in the Niagara region Response. to provide the supports necessary to assist the children in that region the way we're working with all other regions to provide supports. The supplementary question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in the face of an unprecedented health and homelessness crisis, Londoners have rallied behind a transformational whole-of-community response to help those struggling with homelessness, mental health and addictions. With leadership from local agencies, hospitals, emergency services, police, businesses, developers and City Council, our community is united in making system-level change, and a generous donor family has galvanized $35 million in direct community funding. But, Speaker, London can't do it alone. Will the Premier commit today to funding the hubs and supportive housing units that are core to this first-of-its-kind local strategy? Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, we have been working with the stakeholders in London to understand the needs of the community. We've worked with them uh, with CMHA. There is a crisis hub which diverts individuals away from the hospitals and provides them with the kind of supports and services they need to effectively give them the treatment and the supports that they need. We understand in the continuum of care that there are different aspects, and we are making investments, whether it's withdrawal management, treatment beds, housing to support the individuals as they transition out. These are all aspects of the roadmap to wellness. They're all parts of the continuum of care, and they all par are part of the social determinants of health that go to the very underlying issue of addictions. So we are making those investments and building that continuum of care. Again, after neglect over 15 years by at the previous Response. government, it's very difficult to put all of these in place and ensure that they're all working together. But we are filling gaps. We are working with communities to, to uh, stakeholders. To Thank you. And the next question, member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. The people of my riding are greatly concerned about the ongoing problem of car thefts. Many Ontarians rely on their family car to commute to work and take their kids to school. Unfortunately, reports of criminal activity targeting cars are becoming a regular occurrence. In Brampton, recently released data indicates that since 2019, car thefts have risen 97% in Peel region. I want to echo the words of Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown, who stated, we can't accept auto theft as a way of life in Canada's biggest cities. The city of Brampton is home to a culturally diverse population, good neighbors, and a friendly people. It's not home for criminal activity. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what actions our government is taking to address this ongoing issue? Good question. Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member from Brampton West and for his leadership in his community and thank him for the question. And let me say this absolutely straight. 
Car theft is absolutely unacceptable. Everyone deserves to feel safe in their own homes, communities, and in their own vehicles. We're proud of our record investment and working hand-in-hand -hand with law enforcement to tackle automobile thefts across Ontario. And our government is investing over $61 million in new technology for the police that will allow them to identify stolen vehicles much faster, such as the automated license plate reader. And we're also investing $267 million through the Community Safety and Policing Grant Program. We are always listening to police on Spots. methods, tools, and support that they can use to keep their communities safe. Mr. Speaker, Everyone deserves to live safely in their community, and our government will not stop until absolutely everyone is safe. Yeah. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for his response. Auto theft is not minor criminal activity. This is organized crime. National and international criminal networks don't just resell stolen cars to generate money. The money they collect is used for further crimes such as drug trafficking, arms dealing, and human smuggling. Criminal activity and fraud are among the factors that impact overall claims cost for Ontario's auto insurance consumers. Car theft claims have increased by 31% in Ontario since 2020. And Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, every auto insurance customer is now bearing the cost of these criminal activities. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please elaborate on how our government's investment will support our local police partners in addressing this ongoing issue? The Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, and once again, I'm very grateful to my friend, my colleague from Brampton West. Just a few weeks ago, Halton Police seized 35 vehicles that were stolen from across to the Toronto area on their way to Dubai. Mr. Speaker, the estimated value of these cars was over $2 million. I'd like to thank Halton Police, their regional auto task force, and especially Chief Steve Tanner for carrying out this operation. It is due to the tireless efforts of people like Chief Tanner and his police officers that keep Ontario safe. I want to say one more thing. We are imploring the federal government to increase border protections. And I've said, and as I have said in every conversation with Minister Mendicino, meet me at the border and see for Response. yourself. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We have correction officers visiting us today. We've been put in front on the front lines of Ontario's mental health crisis. That's because when people can't get the health care and the services they need in the community, they end up in Ontario's overcrowded and understaffed jails. Ontario's chief coroner has found that this system is broken and is killing people. Almost twice as many deaths in custody in 2021 than just two years earlier. Speaker, Will the Premier listen to correction officers here today and ensure they have the staff, the resources, and the training they need to deliver on people's basic human rights while in custody? Thank you. To reply, Mr. General. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank uh, the member for the question. And we're delighted, as was said earlier, that we have members of OPSU right here uh, with us today. And we are. We are appreciative of their commitment to keep our province safe. I want to say that our government is acting in spending and in investing over $500 million to modernize our correctional facilities. Our government is acting in hiring over 1,400 new correctional officers, some of which just graduated last week. And our government is acting again, Mr. Speaker, understanding that employee wellness is important, and we are providing resiliency training for frontline staff and improving managerial awareness of mental health issues through mandatory training. We will always, Mr. Response. Speaker, appreciate and acknowledge the hard work done every day by everyone that keeps Ontario safe. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I always appreciate the response, but if you cared about correction officers and paramedics, you would do something about Bill 124. Yes, speaker, my question is to the Premier. 
Community Addiction Services of Niagara, or Quezon, is a vital social service agency in Niagara for those dealing with mental health and addiction issues. Unfortunately, those important services for my community are getting harder and harder to deliver. Quezon has not seen an increase to their base funding since 2020 and expect only a 2% increase this year. They have a wait list and in many cases can't meet the support and resource levels necessary to help their clients. Speaker, will the Premier commit to working with Quezon and providing the necessary funding they need to address the mental health and addiction crisis we have in Niagara so they don't have to lay off employees. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. I would very much like to meet with Quezon and understand what their needs are. We have had roundtables in Niagara to try to understand what the needs of the community are. And as I mentioned earlier, we're making investments so that we have the funding we do have the funding in place to implement the roadmap to wellness and ensure that supports and services are there across the board for children and youth and for adults so i will certainly take you up on that uh, offer and have an opportunity to meet with them and uh, discuss what other needs are there and how we can continue supporting all the regions in the province of ontario including niagara thank you thank you very much Point of order, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Peter, uh, Speaker, uh, I just noticed that Ian DeWard is up in the uh, the members' gallery. I just wanted to welcome him from Clack here today. Ian. Thank you. Concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on.